Welcome once again to the Irish NFL Show, brought to you in association with Pundit Arena. Uh, ladies and gents, we're very glad today to have a very special show with a very special guest joining us from the NFL Network and, of course, the host of the Boys and Girl Podcast for Fox Sports Radio. We're joined by Miss Jane Slater. Jane, you're very welcome to the show. I am so honored. This meant so much to know that some friends across the pond cared enough about what I had to talk about as it related to the Cowboys. So thank you, guys. Uh, absolutely. It's our pleasure to have you. And Jane, we ask this to every guest that joins the show. Do you by any chance have any connections to the Emerald Isle, to Ireland in any way, shape, manner or form? So this is an intriguing question right now. And I'm going to kind of go off on a little tangent. So stay with me here. I grew up obviously thinking my last name was Slater. And it might still be, it might not. My aunts thought it would be very fun uh, over Christmas two years ago to do a 23andMe test. And so my dad took it, the youngest of six brothers and sisters, and his father is not aligned with theirs. And the website shows that he is linked to two Irish families, one that came right off the boat and one that I don't want to, like I said, this is privacy and we're still, we're actually doing some digging on this, but there is a very strong chance I'm very Irish. <laughs> so Very interesting. So it's an opportune question, opportune question. Yes. <laughs> We uh, maybe we'll we'll have you back on again, Jane, when uh, when you've done the the digging into that. But um, we're delighted to have the opportunity to talk to you. And look, the biggest talking point in in Dallas this off season is is Dak. And we saw your tweets earlier on today that there have been some good talks on both sides. And they but they might need a year to to get this done potentially. I suppose just wondering, do you do you think there's a, a potential for a long term deal to get done before they need to to tag Dak? So this thing has been so complex. So I might walk out a bunch of scenarios for you guys to sort of understand that this is not as simple as just sign deck, which is what a lot of people are saying. Why wouldn't you sign deck? He has, I, I wrote this down. They're 42 and 27 with him. He's got the seventh best passer rating in league history, tied with Tom Brady and just his what five years in the league. Uh, he's 27 years old. And he's a guy that's done everything right. And I can tell you this, he is the guy you see on the field and the guy you see off the field. He is, there is nothing about him that has changed other than probably a reluctance to be more open with the media, given some knocks on him last year about his admission of depression, you know, the death of his brother, which was awful. And then this notion that as he's negotiating his contract, during a pandemic last year and people are losing their jobs and taking pay cuts, that he was now all of a sudden greedy. So there's one layer of context to this. The second layer of context is the Cowboys have never done a deal of just four years. And that's because they've been in what they call cap hell. Now that is not Dak's problem, that's their problem. And they are going to restructure likely a number of contracts here in the next couple of weeks to get under the cap. And when they restructure, what they do is they essentially write the player a fat check and they move some money down the line. But it's easier to do that when you give them some breathing room. So if they've got a four-year deal, they can't always do that. It's easier to do that in five years. And so that's what they want. Dak wants respect. He wants to be paid what the market value bears. And the Cowboys made the mistake of waiting till Jared Goff got signed, then Carson Wentz, then Deshaun Watson and Mahomes. So the number's gone up and up and up and up. The Cowboys last year offered Dak, what I was told, five-year deal, 50 million signing bonus, about 110 million of that guaranteed. Now, a lot of people would say, why not just take that? Well, his argument is in four years, when they complete the TV deals, he wants to go back, or I think now it's three years now that we're talking about this. He wants to be able to renegotiate on the market then, see what the market bears. But here is where I think things got a little complicated this year. That injury was a significant one. And it was the worst possible scenario for a guy that signs a franchise tag. Now, he got paid, what, $34.5 million last year, 
The tag is 37.7 this year. If he plays on it and you look at the tags, in three years he's looking at making $123.4 million if they tag him again. So they can tag him again, by the way, in 2022, but that's going to be $54.3 million. That's a lot of money that the, that the Cowboys, who people say don't like this player, are willing to dedicate to Dak. They don't want to give up his rights. Um, the problem is, in order for, let's say the Cowboys decide not to tag him next year, Dak needs then to be healthy, and he needs the Cowboys to have a really good season in order to help his negotiations on the open market. So to me, you're sort of leaving things to chance again. Now, I think the Cowboys and Dak, there's going to be a little bit of give. And to, to go back and answer your question, Colin, I don't think we're going to hear about a long-term deal before March 9th. Uh, I've told that the two sides are talking, which is meaningful because they weren't doing a lot of talking last year. And I was told they're good conversations. When I talked about this this time last year, it was very contentious. Dak Prescott is, at, is also rehabbing at the facility nearly every day, according to a source. Why is that meaningful? If you didn't like your boss or your coworkers or you felt a type of way about them, you're rehabbing somewhere else. You're not showing up at the facility. So that tells me there's not too much scar tissue here, right? So I think both sides want to get it done. I think we're going to see some maneuvering. I would not be surprised if we see videos of Dak working out soon. I wouldn't be surprised if you start hearing, well, the Cowboys might be interested in signing this guy as a backup or bringing Andy Dalton back. Or we hear quarterback names leading up to the draft. He has until, let me look at what the deadline is. He has until the long-term talks in order to get a long-term deal done, they have to be completed by July 15th. So if we get past that date and Dak still hasn't signed his franchise tag, he could go until August, but the Cowboys could rescind that tag. And then he'd have no guaranteed money. He would be a free agent. And that's the worst case scenario. Um, if Dak signs his tag, He's guaranteed $37.7 million. That's guaranteed no matter what happens. And you can still work on that long-term deal till July 15th. So I'm giving people sort of a manageable window here. There's just a lot of stuff that comes with this. And so everybody just goes back to sign Dak. There's a little bit, there's some gamesmanship. There is, this is a, you know, in other uh, contracts that I've covered in negotiations, they've, they've gotten contentious uh but the agents picked up the phone and they've gotten the deal done todd hasn't done that yet um last year dak i was told wanted to sign that franchise tag last year i was told it was dak who picked up the phone leading up to to getting that long-term deal done because he wanted to try in good faith to get something accomplished i know he wants to be in dallas i know he loves his teammates and i know he's not a greedy guy but i think he needs to be shown some respect here and I think the Cowboys need to be given some flexibility. And I think if we can achieve those two things, we get a long-term deal done. But again, two years ago, I was asked, who gets the contract first, Zeke, Amari, or Dak? And I said, oh, this is easy. Dak, Amari, Zeke, because Zeke was two years away. And I couldn't have been more wrong. And it is equally perplexing to not only me that has covered it, but other nationals covering it, other uh, local beat writers covering it. This has been a very uh, tricky negotiation. Um, it just feels like they've really dug in their heels. Uh, th they've both been formidable forces in contract negotiations. Jane, interested to hear your thoughts on Mike McCarthy. Last season, it was a difficult season. There was a lot of speculation during the season that he'd lost the locker room. We obviously then had that watermelon instant the night before the, the Vikings game, and they seemed to rally towards the back end of the season with some wins. Is he in a situation where the season, albeit it's a long way off, doesn't go according to plan and they're not competing for the, the NFC East? Do you think his job potentially could be in jeopardy? I think it's hard to say. Uh, Mike didn't lose the locker room per se. His defensive coordinator and his defensive line coach did. And I didn't want to get into names at the time because 
players were already told, being told at the time to not talk to the media. Um, I knew that there was a lot of, I, I've been likening it to if you're, uh, you guys do have swimming pools in, in Ireland, right? I don't know what the, the temperament is there for, for this. Like, does it, the ground, you know, do you have cracks in the pool if you put them in the ground? When you're, when you're putting chlorine in your pool, there's a lot that goes into like the pH balance of it, right? It got really acidic in the locker room when they brought in a lot of these free agents with very dominant personalities and some complexities, you know, like some of these guys uh, were dealing with alcohol problems or, uh, again, not to mischaracterize things, but they were dealing with off the field things. And so you had a bunch of homegrown guys who weren't feeling supported by this new coaching staff. In fact, this coaching staff was being very supportive to these new free agents. So that's going to create some friction, right? Um, there was some other stuff that I'd, I'd rather not get into, but I do think Dan Quinn is going to give them some stability in that locker room. Um, it's still unclear if they're going to be a 4-3 or 3-4 defense. Uh, I'm under the impression that Dan Quinn really likes Alden Smith, so he'll be back as a defensive end. There's at least one defensive player I think that's mulling retirement, and I want to be respectful to him and not say who that is. Um, Jalen Smith, I'm told, will be back. And I'm told with the number 10 pick, they're really honing in on a cornerback. So keep an eye on Patrick Sertan uh, out of Alabama. So I think they're going to address some of those defensive woes. And so I think if they can address that, and they've got Dak as their quarterback, and Tyron Smith and Lyle Collins – are progressing the way I've told they're playing, Mike's going to have a better season. And it was almost like an old dog learning new tricks. Yeah, he might have spent a year away learning some of the nuances to the game and saying, you know, that he's evolved. Mm -hmm. I don't think what he evolved very well into was this Zoom interaction, connecting with your players, not having your guys in the locker room to bond and do team building exercises. I think that stuff really, really hurt. Mike. And then you had the unexpected death of your strength and conditioning coach that you walk in on. And you had all, all the injuries, you know, hitting, you go through four quarterbacks. I mean, it was a lot for a head coach. So I think there's optimism about Mike this year, but I also think that the window, I mean, Jerry has been saying it since I've been working in Dallas, uh, the window's closing. He wants to win now. That's why he moved on from Tony Romo. That's why he moved on from Jason Garrett. And I think because he's ripped the Band-Aid off uh, in recent years, moving on from Des Bryant, it's getting a little easier for him not to have as close of emotional attachment to people as he used to. And I say that because the people around him, I think, are, are not influencing Jerry because Jerry doesn't like that notion. But I think wisely positioning themselves of where they should be and who can help them accomplish that. And so – I. I think Mike's going to have to have a little bit more meaningful success next year, but I think more importantly, he's going to have to have the buy-in because there were a lot of excuses for him last year, COVID injuries mm -hmm. four quarterbacks, et cetera. If you remove those from the table and you have the same record that you have last year in a very weak division, it's going to be hard for Mike McCarthy to, to stay on board. Yeah. Jane, Jane, Brian's a Giants fan, so he know, knows all about a weak division. He knows how bad it is, don't worry. But it's fascinating, some of your insight on that, because obviously last season we all look at the talent pool that them, uh, Dallas had on, on defense, and it didn't make sense. Like even week two against the Falcons and that amazing comeback, it was like, but how did they concede so much? And also on Dak, I think some of our listeners of different teams, should we say, like maybe I know the Chicago Bears have just heard you say, wait a sec, the Cowboys could rescind that tag and he could be a free agent and start getting themselves very excited about these things again, as always. And again, I hate to even put that out there and please don't tweet that no, like no, clickbait or anything because it literally is the worst. Blows up. Like, <laughs> no, that no. is like, it, those things blow up. And, and then like, even this morning I was, you know, talking, I was actually exchanging messages with Dak. And again, he doesn't, place things very close to the vest, but I try to be very, very fair with players and I always reach out. And he was frustrated that Fox had put out that I wanted, that he wanted Patrick Mahomes money. Well, they mischaracterized that. I said, he doesn't want Patrick Mahomes money. He wants to get paid behind Patrick value. Mahomes because that's fair market value. Yeah. Um, so I've got to be very careful about what I say and like what people turn into clickbait and mischaracterize things because 
it is a, a tricky situation and public perception is everything. And I don't think that Dak is greedy and I don't think that Dak is asking for anything unreasonable. I think both of these sides have made mistakes in negotiations and I hope they both realize that and, and realize the value of each other moving forward. Yeah. They need couples therapy, I, yeah. I think is, is what I'm getting <laughs> yeah. at. And we, we've got a group, a cord in Ireland, they call for marriage counselling. We'll, we'll yes. send them over, give them, give them a bit of a hand over there. But actually, you, you mentioned about characterization in the media. And obviously, you've covered the Cowboys for a number of years. And we've been very fortunate. We've had some great media guests and Peter King and Paul Pabst and Tom Panisaro on the show um, recently. And, and you know, we, always tend to ask, <laughs> we always tend to ask them their favorite interview story or their favorite experience. But you've covered the Cowboys. So I just have to ask. It's very simple. What's the best Jerry Jones story? Because everyone has a Jerry Jones story. I have so many, um, <laughs> so many. But one of the moments, you know, as a, as a journalist, you find yourself at, to peel the curtain back a bit. I grew up in the Dallas area. I grew up in Rollette, which is about 20 minutes from downtown Dallas. And when I was in middle school and high school, so ages 12 to 16 here in the States, the Cowboys were winning Super Bowls. Kids were were wearing those cowboy starter jackets. I don't know if you guys, you know, had yeah. them over there. And yeah. Jimmy Johnson was having parades, and then it was Barry Switzer. And Michael Irvin even had to do I, – I've told him this story before. He had to do community service once, and he came to my school as part of the whole probation because of the, the hotel situation. And the kids were merciless in their questions of him. And I remember apologizing to him on behalf of my school as a 17 year old. And now I work with him. And so like the Cowboys for me and Jerry Jones were just iconic. And so when I started like legitimately working for them and, you know, like it's, you have to remove it being a cool experience because you have to be an objective journalist. Right. But I had started anchoring on good morning football and, and Jerry had, had seen it and he stopped me on the, the, tennis courts uh, at training camp and he goes giant I just got to tell you I looked up at the TV today and I saw you and I thought to myself she's one of ours and it again it shouldn't as a journalist you shouldn't feel validated by the owner of a team that you cover I mean that's like tricky right like you can't be like trying to do stories to make a person proud of you but it it was unique that I've worked in this market for a very long time in various roles from producer to traffic reporting to radio to news to sports and to have appreciated the fact that he saw the grind and recognized that I was getting my due finally and to be very clear Jerry doesn't make those calls and and get Jane Slater an opportunity like that it was the fact that he recognized that it just People don't realize when you meet Jerry how charismatic he is. Uh, people that I meet in the business community that meet Jerry are always shocked that he knows your name, that he remembers things about you. And so when people doubt him as a GM and his football prowess, I used to do a sports talk show in Dallas five days a week, four hours a day on 105 Through the Fans, which is our, you know, the Cowboy Station. And when we would talk to him about personnel, typically if you talk to a head coach, He's like, oh yeah, 23 this week or whatever. He literally could go down names and give you uh, nuances to their game, what he loved about them. And players tell me that like they're able to just text him or go into his office. That is something that is unique about him. So as much as people want to knock Jerry, I always describe him as sort of what Walt Disney was, like the Imagineer. Like when he built the star in Frisco, I believe it was three years from idea. And he always used to say on the radio, he had a notepad in his truck. And so when he'd call in and do radio, we'd hear him tapping on the dashboard, driving, you know, to the star or writing notes on his notebook. And he would say that he had a notepad next to his bed. And he's always just, ideas are always there. But that idea for the star in Frisco from idea to completion three to four years. That's impossible in construction and funding. And, and if you guys ever make it across the pond and come to Frisco and you're a Cowboys fan, it's really cool. Uh, So I would say like, I have, like I said, a ton of stories about Jerry, but. That one stands out. That's the one. 
uh, it's just his authentic his authenticity and there's a reason so many Cowboys players want to keep resigning with the team build houses in Frisco off season there and then eventually want to work and partner with him in some capacity like he really does take care of his guys and as much as he was getting knocked for Black Lives Matters etc I think there's a lot of people that know Jerry that would completely disagree with the notion that he doesn't care or that he is a racist or wasn't doing enough to promote young men. That's just, that's yeah. my take on it. Yeah. I oh, know. Look, I mean, he's a billionaire and he's extremely charismatic with, for good reasons. He's been successful. Uh, a friend of mine uh, works in the U S and has met various people. I remember one time asking him who's the most amazing or most charismatic person he'd ever met. And his answer to me was, yeah, it's a toss up between Bill Clinton and Jerry Jones. And that to me kind of put it into comparison. So, yeah, okay, fair enough. We get that. We get that. You know what I, what I love about Jerry is look, some of Jerry's missteps have been very, very public. Um, as anybody who shines bright or has had success, I mean, we, we don't want to see people succeed, right? We want to see them fail. And he's had some, some public slip ups and he's been honest about you know, being broke and poor growing up and his family owned a grocery store in Arkansas and how he married Jean, his wife, and she gave him the Cadillac that he sold and how his father thought it was a terrible idea to buy the Cowboys the first time he approached. And like, he really is like one of those stories of a guy who just believed, grinded, failed. But I also find him, he always talks about showing others grace and mercy. And again, people knock him so much for the second chances he gives players. I really respect somebody like that, that can own their failures, but also recognize other people's missteps and want to give them second chances. So that's like another thing that when people ask me about Jerry long when he's gone, though, those are a number of things that'll stand out for me about him. Now, Jerry and I don't always see eye to eye. We didn't see eye to eye on this Cowboys report. That was fun earlier in the year, but I, I authentically respect Jerry Jones and who he is and, and what he's accomplished. Yeah, and I saw I saw Jerry going into uh, MetLife. I was over for a Giants Cowboys game a number of years ago, and he came in and he took his time going into the stadium and he signed every autograph outside for all the young children. And when I saw the security were trying to rush him in, he was kind of saying, "Leave me alone. I want to I want to acknowledge all these people that have come up to me." And he took so much time out to. To sign the autographs and I actually said to myself at the time that's a man who kind of reflects on he remembers what it was like as a young person growing up when he was as you said he's not the billionaire he was when he was a, when he was a young person and that's what it is about him I, I think you you actually touched on something I think that's important there are some people that do that so they're perceived a certain way right like I am so amazing with kids I'm amazing with people and then the minute they're away from those people it wasn't about the people it was about them jerry is a truly a fan of the game and i've like it was last year at combine i was with mike vrabel i believe kyle shanahan maybe Cl cliff kingsbury but it was like three coaches and they literally were like we want to meet jerry like they were we want to meet jerry so I said, Jerry, would you mind coming over real quick? And of course, he's a huge fan. Vrabel's just literally been um, in the playoffs. And of course, he played with the Patriots. And of course, Cliff. And I, like I said, I think Kyle was there. And Kyle and I went to college. Again, full disclosure, I've known Cliff forever. So now we're all the same age in this business. But Jerry locked in on them and got emotional talking about his playing days at Arkansas. And it's just he literally, you know, when you're just passionate about something, you light up. And I've heard his story about Arkansas football every year at this lunch that they do ahead of the season. And it never gets old for me because it's not canned. It literally comes from a place of humility and appreciation that he was part of a locker room and part of a team and that he gets to do this for a living. Folks, he could make so much more money if he applied half the energy and passion that he does to the Cowboys and other businesses. But he has leaned so in to, to this game, to growing it with like the broadcasting rights and been innovative there and to this team that I just, I, I admire him in that way. Like there are, there are aspects about him that 
I really, really admire. We were fortunate to chat to Wade Phillips uh, a few weeks ago and, and he uh, had some very fond memories. He talked very fondly about Jerry and, and still keeping in touch and how Jerry always looked out for him and his family. Jim, it would, before we let you go, it would be remiss. We're, we're fast approaching free agency. Um, what, what are you expecting from, from the Cowboys outside of the, the DAC side of things? But what might we see the Cowboys do in the upcoming free agency? It's a good question because I think it is, I, I can tell you what I expect from the front office because that hasn't changed. What I can't tell you I expect is what Mike McCarthy and Dan Quinn are looking for. Uh, full disclosure, we haven't had any conversations with the coaching staff or even Dan Quinn. Um, so I don't know if it's going to be a 4-3 defense or a 3-4. The free agents they brought in last year didn't make a lot of sense. Gerald McCoy was a guy they obviously didn't get uh, an opportunity to have on their team, but he is a leader I know that's respected. I actually saw him working out close to the start in Frisco at a performance center uh, a couple of weeks ago. He's been grinding. I've been told he's been mentoring young guys up there. So he stayed in the area. Uh, I think he'd want to come back. So we'll see if the Cowboys bring him back. Again, I told you they want to bring Alden Smith back. So that's a free agent. So that's two free agents that they would sign. And I think if we're going to see – any other free agents, uh, you know, it might be like a safety or a corner, but I think it's going to be a veteran type safety that's maybe been in the league five years that's that's not going to break the bank. They're not going to go after an Earl Thomas or a Jamal Adams type player, uh, but those would be the moves that I would expect them to make because, again, we just went through the cap and needing to get under it. Yeah. They're going to be replenishing and restocking the pond through the draft, and they're then they're going to – try and go out there and get them some pieces for depth. But Cowboy fans get so frustrated every year that they aren't big players in free agency. They're the biggest fish they're trying to fry right now and catch and bring into the boat is Dak Prescott. And that's where their focus is right now. So that would be, and again, I could be surprised. I was shocked they went out and got Gerald McCoy. I was shocked when they went out and got um, Alden Smith. I mean, so there were moves that they've made that were surprising to me. I just I, I can see them going back to what worked for them before. Uh, but again, I'm I, I can't wait to find out if they're going to go four three or if they're going to stay this three four course because it was a scheme they forced last year with personnel that didn't have enough time to work with it, nor did they have the depth to do it. And so the, by forcing it, that's where we saw some of the problems. Yeah. And, and Jane, of course, with Dan Quinn coming in, whether they're going to flip to a cover three defense with aggressive corners and how he's going to remold that defense is going to be fascinating to see. Look, Jane, I um, want to be really respectful of your time. Thank you ever so much for joining us this evening and sharing your insights with our viewers around Ireland, the UK and Europe. Um, loved hearing from you. Loved hearing the stories and the insights of the Cowboys and the inner workings there. And sure. You know, when we get towards the start of the next season, when they figured out the free agency, who the quarterback's going to be, um, maybe we'll reach out and have you on again, maybe sometime. But thank you. And I'd thank you for all the great work you guys do. This was fun. Thank you, guys.